So um, I am here this morning with Sarah Emmett from Art With Heart. So Sarah, thank you so much for being here with us at Excel 2020. And I wonder if you could just start by introducing yourself and telling us your current role in the performing arts. Uh, hi, uh, I am Sarah. I am the co-creative director of Art With Heart. Um, so there is myself and Rachel that run the company jointly um, and we make performance participation uh, and education projects both locally in terms of Greater Manchester and nationally too. So we work with lots of different types of, of people both enabling others to make creative and cultural ventures but also we make uh, performances and things that we will tour nationally as well. Great. And Sarah, maybe you could start by telling us a little bit of the, um, maybe the training or the process that led you up until this point, like what, what kind of um, courses or experience did you have leading up to creating this company? Um, I, th I like to say I made it by fluke, really, uh, <laughs> because I never intended, I never intended to have a company. I never intended to make work. I never intended to write or really devise. I thought I am a performer. That's what I'm going to do. So uh, I went to college, studied theatre studies, then fortunately got into university, which I, ne I never thought would happen either. Like people didn't talk about university where I'm from. So it was kind of a really big deal that I went to uni um, and did performing arts and media studies at, at Salford. And then... Um, and through that course, I kind of felt it was really great to start to make work. But I always thought, oh, this is great. Like, I'll use this opportunity at university to make work because I'll probably never get that opportunity again. Ha ha ha. Um, so um, I just thought, oh, great. Like, take it while I can. This is really, really, you know, enjoyable and fun and challenging and I really got a thrill out of it. And then I thought I was going to leave university, get an agent, be an actor. That's it. Um, but I knew that I wanted to do other stuff as well. Like I had lots of interest in uh, working with young people and education and um, facilitation. And so I'd always kind of done that as well. But in my, in my mind, when I was like at university, I always saw those as like two different things. So I would always, I always knew, you know, if you're a performer, you always need a kind of other job. So I thought, okay, well, facilitating and youth work and working with young people and education is one thing. And then my performing arts thing is another. And it wasn't until I, I mean, I was in my twenties where I just started getting jobs where the two started to mix together. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And then I started to, to write, not even necessarily to put it on but just because I had an idea and I thought oh I, I really fancy getting out like I really enjoyed being creative in that way at university so I'm just gonna try and do it and then the more I did and and then I just sort of fell into it and accidentally people were like oh that's really good do it for this festival oh that's really good do it for this festival and I was like oh this is, this is quite good and then my kind of two worlds were mixing and mixing more and more and then the more I worked for other companies the more I thought, I reckon I could probably do it better than that. So, <laughs> so I set up a company. So it was kind of, yeah, it, I, I literally just fell into everything. There was, there was no plan. Yeah. So I, I don't, I think some, I always knew I wanted to work in the arts, like from a very, very young age. I always knew I wanted to work in theatre and I wanted to, to work creatively. But I think it was never instilled in me from a young age that you could do it for yourself. I think it was always this sense of, well, if you're, and, and I think it is a class thing. Like if, if you're working class, you get the sense of like work will be given to you. You don't, you, you don't get to be the boss, you know? So it was a really bizarre, strange feeling. And I think essentially my whole career, I've sort of, at various points had that kind of imposter syndrome of like oh my god how have I how have I got a 
company? How am I doing this national tour? How am I like making these things happen? Because I never expected that to be the case. So I can't remember what your question was now. Oh, what have you, what have you done? Loads of stuff. <laughs> uh. It was just about how you got to be where you are. You did answer the question beautifully. So okay. And just for people who maybe don't know much about Art with Heart, I wonder if you could talk us through one of your projects to give us a sense of the sort of work we're talking about here. So maybe if you could just give us an idea for people who might not know. Um, so, uh, I suppose there's two different types of projects. So we've got the, the projects that kind of we produce that we will take out on the road. So like Declaration is an example of that, which was the last national tour that we did, which um, was a piece of contemporary theatre, which uh, we took out on the road. So we toured it nationally over like two years, um, won shiny awards, it was really beautiful. But the thing for us is never that it's just a performance. So there's always lots of other things happening around it. So even within that project, I think for a lot of people in the public, you might see, oh, they have this performance and it goes on a national tour and it's in theatres and people come and pay for a ticket and see it. But alongside that, so the, the piece itself was looking at ADHD, mental health and diagnosis. So alongside that, we had a, a curated wellbeing room with uh, a mental health practitioner um, which the audience could use before, during and after. So there were like um, well-being activities uh, that people could think about their own mental health and well-being, but was also a space where there was a trained practitioner for them to have uh, that one-on-one -on -one interaction with someone who was safe and knew what they were talking about and wasn't just someone who was coming from personal experience. It was someone who was a professional in that field. And then we also ran um, training for teachers and youth workers and arts facilitators um, on ADHD and mental health and working with young people. Uh, so there was kind of a performance, a wellbeing room, a training aspect. And then we also did workshops with people. So we did um, on a separate day, we did workshops with children with ADHD, looking at how they uh, are able to accept that part of themselves more and kind of thrive within it. And then also we ran that with adults as well. So there's kind of always loads and loads of stuff happening with one project. And then we have other projects where uh, we work with community groups to uh, elevate their work. So we just work with them to support them to make the work that we tour. So Golden Years Caravan was uh, an example of that where we were looking at the stigma of aging um, and retirement and how, you know, the kind of stock images uh, and sort of sound bites that we have of, of older people, um, so people you know 55 plus, is all of a similar ilk and doesn't actually reflect the the people in our society. You know, if you're 55 and you're 98, that's a I mean that's completely different generations, and yet we've just clumped all these people. It's like oh, if you're you know if you're over 70, you're kind of done, um, and you know older people in our communities are really thriving and really important parts of our community and are doing these incredible things that just go under the radar. So what we wanted to do is really challenge that perception of older people. And so we uh, created a photographic exhibition, a film, and had lots of participatory activities. And so we toured the piece. So all of their work, so we had artwork and crafts and things that were all displayed uh, in this beautiful caravan, which was an absolute nightmare to tour, but looked beautiful, uh, which, um, which had a forecourt of, you know, deck, uh, deck chairs and fake grass. It was all really beautiful. Um, and it popped up in, spaces where you wouldn't consider art so like our, our touring work is in the theatre it doesn't always have to be but predominantly is but then our participation work it, it went to um assisted living communities outside libraries um in uh nature parks in uh shopping centers so it kind of went all over and people just came across it and we were able to make these really kind of special connections with people and the work and yeah anyway i just sort of like 
wax lyrical about our own work, but yeah. Uh, so it's kind of very, it's, it's, it's all the same motivation. It's all about looking at how we can make change and how we can really think about society and how we want the world to look and how we want society to be. And so the work itself might look very different, but it's always channeling towards that sense of, of change and challenging people and society. Great. And obviously through the, you know, through performance and the work that you do. Um, and I think there's probably going to be quite a few young people watching this who might just be on the path of saying that they're interested in performing arts and not sure whether, you know, if there's a career for them or that they could make it. Um, what sort of advice would you give to them in terms of thinking about, you know, should I, should I pursue this or should I get a proper job? Yeah, I mean, I would say do both, uh, always. I'd say, like, I, you know, my proper job and my, you know, hopeful dream job sort of mixed together. And I think, actually, I am 100% a better artist and maker because of that, because I understand different parts of um, the people we work with and society and kind of the makeup of things a lot, a lot more. And I think all those kind of skills that I learn. So like, you know, working in sales, it might feel like, oh God, I'm, I'm working in sales and this is terrible and it's just paying the bills. But actually, if it depends what lens you view it through, because if you're just thinking of it as your real job or your proper job, and you're just, just doing sales, then you're not really thinking about, okay, well, how can this be an advantage to me? Because actually, if you're really good at sales, you'll probably be really good at marketing. Like if you can so if you can sell snow to snowmen, then you're absolutely going to win at marketing. Do you know what I mean? And and fundraising. And so there's loads of different skills that you can learn. Like I worked in loads of pubs, uh, in like proper rough pubs from where I'm from, up to like sort of fancy cocktail bars and looking at like the different types of people that frequent those places and and having to like almost change your demeanor in order to like get tips <laughs> get the cash so like if you think about those jobs as almost like training then not only does it make your job like a more bearable but actually you're able to then use that skill to influence you as an artist and what you make and i think whether you want to make whether you want to make a piece whether it's devised or write it or or produce it or perform in it like those all those skills are really valuable and all those skills just make you a more rounded person so whether you want to go off and work for the royal shakespeare company just do you know bashing out some shakespeare it's not all about just having been to like top drama schools and doing all these things like actually what we need in performance right now and, and in that in the kind of creative ecology is a much broader representation of people and what you bring to the piece so like for example when we're casting something we're never just looking for the best actor in the room because that's that's like almost I mean it's like two thirds of the job isn't it it's like half the job the other half is like are you good to work with are you a team player are you going to put the effort in or are you just going to rock up five minutes late do the bare minimum and get off or are you going to be there for example when your costume breaks and everyone's really stressed are you going to be like do you know what don't worry about it I'll just sew the button on like it's you know what I mean like those small things actually being a team player in that room and being part of that collective is so much more important sometimes than being the best person. Like, you know, so you don't, you don't have to have, I think you bring you is what I'm saying. You bring you. So if you have just sat in your room thinking, Oh, I'm not good enough and I, I couldn't have gone to, I don't know, RADA or whatever. And I, you know, all I've done is just work in uh, this shop or this pub. Then of course you're not going to be the best person in the room because you're going to be the person that doesn't think you're good enough. 
but actually if you're bringing yourself and you're bringing enthusiasm and you're bringing like a passion for the company and the work and all the rest of it then actually that makes up quite a lot of why you would get that job it's not just about do you have the exact perfect skill that sort of went on a bit of a tangent but yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great, Sarah. And because one of my next questions would be, what would be um, your tips in terms of professional skills? Because often we're talking about performance skills to students when they're learning, but you know we know that professional skills are just as important. So, what would you be your top tips for um, developing professional skills? I'd say, like, be kind. Be kind. Be generous be like really value people's time and I think if you've got those things you're on sort of onto a winner like sometimes like I still experience this now you'll you'll speak to someone you know who is a gatekeeper or hire at the chain or whatever it is you'll speak to someone and they're really short with you like you'll phone them and you'll be like right I've got to ask them this thing. okay okay here we go here we go and you're all like geared up and you're you know really thinking about your projects and you're like oh yeah this is gonna be great okay okay let's do it and they're like no and just really short with you and you're like oh oh god and I always have to tell myself but that person has a life too like that person has probably got you know their their child might be sick and they've just had a phone call from the school and they've got to leave the office to go and pick them up or they've just had a really horrendous phone call about something else that's happening in the building or they're just having a really bad day or they you know they just don't they, they can't right now i think if you take things really personally and i think when you work in the arts there are you know our heart our soul everything is into it and so we it's almost like when you work in the arts you have to really work hard to empathize with other people because getting those rejections and getting those oh well you were down to the last two or getting those no we're not interested right now or no ring back another time or you know getting those kind of buffers is is, is quite difficult and can really dent you and I think in some people that can make them a bit resentful and a bit kind of angry but I think if you are always remembering to be kind and you're always remembering to be kind of generous and and thinking about the you know we're all just people we're all just people doing a job and we're not we're not setting out to be really terrible to you um but also reply to people so this is another thing this is my other tip that just sort of went around the houses as it usually does with me but um, if people say to do a thing, do a thing. So like I, I have been on both sides of this where I've missed out on something, but also offered my time and they haven't taken me up on it. So like if someone says, if a caster or a producer or a director or whoever it is says, I really, I really love your work you haven't got it this time you haven't got the job or you haven't got this opportunity or whatever it is but I really like you and I really want to work with you so give me give me a ring in six months time or send me an email in a few months and we'll maybe you know we'll, we'll figure something out or make sure you audition for the next thing like write it down and do it because I've I've not done that because I've thought oh they're just being nice to me like oh they just feel sorry for me because I'm actually not not good enough and then I've missed out on that opportunity and then it's you know a year two years and you're like it's too late now I can't can't follow that up but I've also said to loads of people email me email me your script I'll, I'll read it I'll give you some feedback or send me a funding application and I'll I'll send you some feedback on it or you know a whole host of things that I've offered my time for free or you know send people opportunities and things and people people just do that thing where they're like oh no I won't or forget like set a calendar reminder and do it and send it and if like me you say if I don't reply to your email in a week send me a reminder actually do send me a reminder like take people by their word but also you know be kind and value their time Great, thank you. Well, it's um, always a long-winded answer, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, so a question for you uh, from our employability officer. She wanted to know what's the best mistake you've ever made? I wrote, oh wait, wait. I was thinking, okay, wait. Okay, so I, this is what I wrote. I, li I, I didn't follow things up with people when they said to do it. And then it was too late and I forever regretted it. Like there are still, even still now, I can, I can honestly conjure up in my mind like five people that I never did that with. And I think, God, I would have, I could have, I could have been doing that. I could have done that. I could have, and I think I didn't. And I think the root of that mistake was that I didn't believe in myself enough. I didn't believe in myself that it was possible. I didn't believe in myself that I could do that. I've also been offered work, which I have very respectfully sort of slowly stepped away from, going, oh, I just, I'm sure you'll find someone great, um, which has which is just felt massive and just way out of my comfort zone. And just for a long time, I said yes to a lot of things and I'm finally getting to the point now where I'm starting to say no, but I think, quite a few years ago being offered things which I felt like I wasn't ready for but there were people around me saying you are absolutely ready for it. like you would absolutely be brilliant you would nail that it would be amazing and I was just like well oh, I just don't I don't know I, I just I just can't I think sometimes you have to listen to those people around you that you really trust to support you in that decision but also I kind of feel like it would be better for me to be telling you that my best, that, that my kind of most memorable mistake was that I took that job and it was really scary and really challenging and really horrible and I absolutely failed at it than it is for me to say, I said no and now I really regret it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think finding finding your people around you who can not, you know, not just say, oh, you're brilliant, you're brilliant, you're brilliant, but actually give you kind of constructive criticism, help you be better, um, and a mentor and someone that you can kind of learn from and that can support you through those, you know, step changes of, of jobs and stuff. Um, so that, yeah, you can feel more confident to say yes to that stuff. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. And last question has kind of got two parts to it. So what would be the best and the worst part of your job? I think the worst part, I'll, I'll do the, I'll do the like negative then positive. Um, the worst part is definitely waiting. <laughs> it's a lot of waiting. Um, whether it's waiting for someone to reply to your email or it's waiting for um, funding to arrive or it's waiting in terms of you sending something in and waiting for a deadline and getting a response like there's a there's a lot of waiting for other people and that can be really frustrating because you just know that your thing is brilliant and you just you just want to do it um so the waiting is the worst um but the best is that i think i think making work and seeing the impact that, that work makes on audiences and participants and further impact like not just the impact of the performance but actually how that stays with people. So how that impact lasts and whether that's like, um, so for example, with declaration, with people saying in person, but also sending messages afterwards saying like this, this enabled me to talk about myself, my mental health uh, in a new way, in a more positive way. It's made me feel more comfortable with it. It's helped me talk to my partner. It's helped me talk to my boss or um, actually it's helped me talk to my doctor. 
and so that has made an, a really significant impact on someone's life and um, and then also our participants being able to you know be creative again when they or for the first time like I remember doing a job uh working with some young people and we did a sharing at the end of the week um and this young woman's um she she was about 12 13 and um and her dad said that it was the first time that she'd ever spoken in public and it the like pride I mean I felt dead proud of her anyway and I didn't know any of that I just thought she'd been amazing for like the weeks that we've been together but that sense of like actually you're you're making changes on people's lives and it and it might not you might not get that instantly but actually people are able to leave with this new sense of themselves and then that change that that makes on society whether it makes us uh think more or more empathetic or understand ourselves or understand the world a little bit more I think is just the most incredible thing ever yeah great that's a lovely way to end <laughs> yay <laughs> and Sarah if people want to know more about art with heart um tell us what they where they should go what they should do so you can go with art with heart just three words, artwithheart.org.uk. Um, that's our website. Uh, social media links and everything are on there. That's the easiest thing. But yeah, if you want to say hello, uh, it's you can email hello at artwithheart.org.uk. Brilliant. And thank you so much for your time. Um, thank and for you. All of your great advice. Thank you. It's been ace. Thank you very much.